From the MCADSV headquarters in Jefferson City, I'm Matthew Huffman, Public Affairs Director, and this is Momentum, a webcast produced by your coalition for advocates across the state. In this inaugural episode, I am going to be talking with our CEO, Colleen Coble, and our Public Policy Director, Jennifer Carter Dockler. Jennifer, Colleen, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Happy to be here and happy to start off the, the webcast talking about legislative advocacy. Yeah, I'm really excited that uh, in this inaugural, as I mentioned, episode, we're going to be talking about legislative and public policy advocacy. We are uh, just a couple weeks into the 100th, 100th there it is, uh, Missouri General Assembly, and there's already been quite a bit to keep track of, to monitor, and I know you two have been working really hard already, so let's jump right in and get started. Um, I was kind of thinking that to start out our conversation, we could really talk about some of the lingo that we use when we talk about legislative and public policy advocacy, um, particularly because I think we have a lot of jargon that we often use. Um, so, you know, one, just right from the beginning, is to talk about the word coalition and what coalition building means. And so coalition is not only in the name of our organization, it's also really in our DNA uh, inherent in the work that we do. And so I kind of wanted to hear from the two of you, what do you think coalition building really means as it relates to our work? I think in this instance, it is our DNA. Uh, the Missouri Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence started when a handful of advocates who were operating in programs around the state in the late 70s knew that they needed to get laws in place so that they could provide services to those um, in accord with the rights being respected under the law as victims of domestic violence. And so it was what the coalition in a large part, the reason for us to be formed and to come together was to build a coalition, which was community organizing at its root, and come together to have a unified voice at the Missouri Capitol. And it was so successful that not only was the coalition formed, but the first state laws to address domestic violence were uh, passed in legislation. People could get orders of protection for the first time, and there was a real advancement of the movement to end violence in intimate partners, among intimate partners and among families. So then I also kind of want to talk about um, the words uh, grassroots advocacy, and you kind of alluded to that with community organizing. Um, but we do a lot about grassroots advocacy, the need for grassroots advocacy in our work. And so what does that kind of mean in relation to legislative and public policy advocacy? To me, that is making sure that advocates at our programs recognize that the role of an advocate is not only in the one-on-one -on -one direct service advocacy that they provide, but also in the, the bigger picture advocacy in terms of our public policy, um, making sure that their legislators understand what their needs are, what are survivors needing when they come into facilities, and telling those stories. Um, not only do we need to help the stories of survivors to community members to raise awareness, but we need to make sure that legislators who are making critical decisions in our public policy from funding to what bills to pass hear the needs of those who are providing services in their community. So to me, fundamentally part of being an advocate is also to be engaging in our public policy efforts and making sure that we have a very strong unified movement across the state in public policy. And you know, as both of you kind of talk about uh, how we define the work, how we kind of talk about this work in different terminology, um, I think it really helps to capture examples like this to show we do systems change work and uh, we do grassroots work and how they complement one another. And I think that's a really good way of going back to our mission of uniting Missourians around these shared values. And it even gets to our, our public policy motto of we change laws, we change lives. And so really connecting the two of those, that we have to have that systems work uh, and we have to have that grassroots work and how they really drive a lot of our, our work forward in ways that we can see that movement building over time. And I think there is an element in, in each aspect of the work in grassroots advocacy and certainly in public policy advocacy where the, the through line is building relationships. 
And that has been the fuel of our movement for decades and continues to be. So that we know that we have an obligation to find points where we can communicate effectively with those who may appear to be very different from us, but we have an opportunity to engage them in education in ways that really make a difference. And oftentimes we're going to that wonderful moment when a legislator, a policymaker uh, says, huh, I never thought of it like that. You know, we get to be way showers, not in uh, denigrating someone for not understanding, but in helping them understand the realities of violence in the lives of women and children and men in our state, and then to, quite frankly, create champions out of them, because they are in a position to make such a difference. And, and it's the relationship building that we do from the community level all the way up to the state capitol that really is what propels our public policy in the directions we need to address the violence. So many legislators will say, they filed this bill because a constituent contacted them and asked. Mm -hmm. This was something they heard from their community was important. And so having those relationships, and so they're hearing those stories is so important because we want it to be um, things that will be more helpful to domestic and sexual violence as the ideas that are being presented to them. So they absolutely, when they hear from a constituent about needs in their community, leads to what their priority areas are and what they're passionate about. Well, and I think that just in having this conversation, it really reinforces, Colleen, what you said about relationship building. And so when you build those relationships with the elected officials in your community, you bring in that element of storytelling and really grounding your story and the stories of families in your community and uh, being able to relay that to your elected officials, it does help them to set that priority. It helps them to become champions for their community and uh, for particular causes. Um, so I think that that really is something that we have to hold a lot of value in, that helping people tell their story and lift up their stories is a huge part of our work as well. And it's, it's not always easy in some ways because oftentimes what we have to do is let those stories inform policymakers as to why they don't have a good idea mm -hmm. and why a piece of legislation would actually be more harmful to those in their community who are dealing with poverty or who are dealing with violence in their lives, who have um, ongoing unmet needs for health care. There's a whole range of issues that because domestic violence and sexual violence affects all of a person, we know that our advocacy has to address all of those related systems and needs and resources within the community to make sure they're there. So it's from schools to health care to public assistance to housing and education and you know the list goes on and on. So again, those are many different avenues and opportunities to connect with legislators for things they care about in ways that educate them as to this is helpful, and while that seemingly is a good idea, it has unintended negative consequences for those you're wanting to help. And to be able to have those sort of transparent, good communication, that relationship, um, you might not agree with every position that the legislator is taking, but where can you find common ground? Because anybody could be our ally on one piece of legislation. So having that communication and having a good um, rapport with someone to find out where can we agree, where might be we don't disagree, but we can still have good transparent communication about it. I want to stick with this topic of relationship building for a second and bring in term limits. Um, and just could the two of you kind of talk about the importance of continuing to engage with our elected officials and continuing to do that relationship building in an era where we do have term limits and a lot of high turnover? So we started our capital advocacy days um, after term limits really started taking effect. There are pros and cons to term limits. Um, one of the pros is that you never know when you're going to find some new champions. Um, there can be, because of the turnover, new people coming in, more people who we can engage in our issue, and legislators end up in other powerful positions when they are done serving their time in the General Assembly. So it's a huge advantage for us to be able to really grow who understands our issues and those relationships and connections. 
However, it means we have to spend a lot more time um, continually educating people about our issues and the complexity <laughs> to some of our issues. And so, for example, this year with our current General Assembly, we have 25% of the House. So 25% of 163 representatives are brand new. And so they're going to have to be learning about what our bills are, what our funding is, what our services that are being provided in the community. So it takes a lot of time and it's where we really do need to engage our grassroots advocacy with our member agencies to help us with that education. There's just so many more people that we have to be able to really educate about domestic and sexual violence. Well, and I think that also gets to a bit of what you spoke to earlier, Colleen, when we think about the complexity of the work. So it is about health care. It is about education. It is about economic development. It's a number of things that are happening that in many ways directly relate to our work. And so the importance of that grassroots advocacy is being able to make those connections for all our lawmakers, especially if they are coming in with a background in education or in workforce development, but they might not see that direct connection to domestic and sexual violence and then that how affects families in their communities. So that is a big part of it, just being able to continue to have that education, those transparent conversations uh, is so important in this, yeah. No longer can you say, well, that, that legislator has been helping us for 10 years. They don't have that long anymore. Mm -hmm. so, so it really is um, an ongoing relationship that you are building to make sure that the voices of informed legislators can rise to the surface and, and by so doing really affect the development of, of very sound policies. Mm -hmm. um, as we we're kind of talking about the makeup of uh, our current General Assembly and that we have a high number of folks who are newly elected, uh, I want to take a moment for us to have a quick civics lesson too. And so could you speak a bit about the makeup of our General Assembly and how our Missouri State Capitol is different from Capitol Hill, for example? Because uh, I know that sometimes that can be confusing for folks. Absolutely. So there's local, state, and federal government. So our state government is the General Assembly, that is what we call it, that includes 34 senators and 163 House of Representatives if they are all fully staffed or fully, um, if there's no um, vacant positions. And so they meet in Jefferson City at our Capitol building um, between January through mid-May every year. So we are a state that the General Assembly comes together every year um, to pass a budget and pass laws. Um, Congress, uh, we have two U.S. Senators that are statewide um, positions for Missouri and we have eight U.S. House of Representatives. They go to Washington, D.C., and they are comprised of Congress. <laughs> um, and so when people talk about the Hill, they are talking about in D.C., um, the Hill there. Not to be confused with the Hill in Jefferson City. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Capitol <laughs> building in Jefferson City does sit on a hill. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not called the Hill. No. Yeah. No, and our U.S. Congress then is meeting throughout the year. They have recesses, um, but they are on a very different schedule than our General Assembly. Mm -hmm. Which I think also really helps to highlight just the importance of grassroots advocacy. We have a smaller amount of time with our General Assembly here in Missouri to really help inform their work and educate them on issues. Um, and the scope of their work also looks very different from local to state to federal level. And so really being able to tailor that grassroots advocacy to the folks in your community and help them to understand what is happening, what are the dynamics. Yeah. So I also know that uh, we are just a couple weeks into legislative session, and I know that the two of you have been very busy already uh, monitoring a lot of bills, starting to attend some hearings. So let's talk a bit about uh, what some of our priorities are for this legislative session. One of the uh, most controversial uh, areas of law that Missouri has not been able to achieve um, is passage of legislation that would prohibit domestic violence offenders and those who are respondents to full orders of protection, orders of protection that have been issued by a court after a hearing, 
um, to prohibit those individuals who've already used violence against their family or intimate partners, prohibit them from gun possession. It's been the federal law since the mid-90s, and Missouri has not ever had a law in place that parallels those federal statutes, which means that local law enforcement officers can't enforce a law that's only federal, and prosecutors can't bring offenders to the court process to be held accountable. And as a consequence of those and many other things, Missouri continues to be in the top 10 states of the number of women who are killed by their male partners with a firearm, using a firearm. We have no ability to place those limitations on known violent offenders and confiscate the guns. It's really controversial in terms of those who see this as a second, a second Amendment issue. Our position is this has very little to do with the Second Amendment. This is about holding offenders accountable for their violence and by their acts of violence, they forfeit their Second Amendment rights. So once again this year, we will be advocating and uh, testifying in favor of legislation that would limit access to firearms by those who've shown to be violent. One of our other priority areas is to um, have housing rights in our statute for victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. Uh, for the first time, we actually have four bills filed this year, one in the Senate and three in the House, um, and hearings will occur on at least two of the House versions. Um, and so this would allow a victim, or um, it would allow a victim to be able to terminate their lease um, if they are able to provide documentation, if the landlord requests it, uh, the landlord may charge a reasonable termination fee. But this is something that we know would be really helpful. Um, it's a very common question that we get here at the coalition. Somebody's come into shelter, an advocate is working with them. They call and say, isn't there a law that would allow this person to terminate their lease? She can't continue to live mm -hmm. there. It's not safe. And to which we respond, we don't have a state law. Um, so we're really excited um, that Senator Arthur, when she was in the House, filed last year. She's expressed a lot of interest in this. Uh, Kansas City City Council actually passed a local ordinance measure on this. So we're gaining a lot of momentum about how important it is that when somebody has been a victim, that they're not required, um, that we create some accommodations for them to be able to terminate their lease without having additional burdens as they're moving forward. There's also a measure that uh, for many years we have, as a coalition, had a position in opposition to uh, legislation back this year again that would change child custody laws. And at the time of the filing for child custody, a judge would need to have uh, evidence that it isn't in the best interest of the child to give both parents equal custody, 50-50. Um, and we know that that is not in the best interest of children when there's been domestic violence, when there's been violence against the child, or even in situations where the family members themselves have come up with their own plan that is not exactly a 50-50 split of time for the parents in custody. So it is um, it's a very emotional series of bills, as anything dealing with child custody is. And uh, we've had our first hearing right off the bat in the Senate on a Senate bill. And there is, um, there is very fervent differences of opinion in the matter, especially the child custody bills. Uh, there's very few people in the legislature who don't have their own experience of a family member or themselves having gone through um, a court process that's similar. So we are hopeful in that we uh, made some progress last year with getting exceptions in the law to uh, address domestic violence very specifically and are hopeful that that will continue this year. But again, sometimes we are um, working to oppose legislation, not to just support measures. One more bill that we are supporting um, that we'd like to continue to share stories with legislators about how it would be important to have this in state law it would require unpaid leave for victims of domestic violence or sexual assault to attend medical or court proceedings. So they could request from their employer time off. It would be unpaid if they need to go get an order of protection or go complete a sexual assault kit. You know, sometimes people wonder why somebody got an ex parte and then didn't show up to the full order hearing, but sometimes people are picking between their job and going to court. 
Um, this is really geared towards individuals who are maybe lower income, don't have a salaried position with benefits. It's very important that they don't lose this job. Um, and so this would allow in state law unpaid leave um, for organizations of a certain size if they need to attend court or medical proceedings. So I really appreciate these examples because, again, I think it goes back to what we've already spoken to just in terms of the complexity and uh, the way that the issues we primarily work on of intimate partner violence, sexual violence, really intersect with so many other areas. So intimate partner homicide prevention, thinking about housing rights, thinking about economic security, thinking about how we can have custody that is actually safe for full families. Um, yeah, there are so many areas in which they really do cross over and affect entire communities. Well, and one of the things that um, we do on a regular basis that um, involves collaborations with other uh, groups, there's legislation that would fundamentally change the uh, civil rights and discrimination, anti-discrimination proceedings on college and university campuses. The Title IX um, rights that are afforded to students so that they're not discriminated against on the basis of gender. Those very uh, tangible protections and benefits would be dramatically changed by legislation that has been filed this year. We are working in concert with many different groups from private and public colleges, both four-year and two-year institutions, to inform legislators who may not have a full understanding of the implications of the negative consequences of their, their legislation. So we're working in concert with them as part of a, a large collaboration. That also comes into play often on uh, legislation that affects children's rights or human trafficking. Uh, so there's, there's uh, health care, there's issues of anti-poverty work, we're working with another large coalition of groups on uh, a proposal to, that would have negative consequences for children by sanctioning or removing the ability of a family to get food stamps if the adult head of the household does not comply with new work requirements. Obviously, that is not something in the best interest of children, in our view, or in the view of many other organizations around the state. So we often lend our voices in harmony with many other organizations that's a real effective way to um, to really educate lawmakers that there isn't just one viewpoint but that oftentimes legislation affects a whole realm of issues and we um, we all benefit from working together that way yeah you know i think that also gets to uh the core service areas of our mission and so uniting Missourians with that shared view that rape and abuse must end uh, and uniting around that value through research, education, alliance, and public policy. And so seeing these four core service areas working in concert together in the way that we live out and fulfill our mission here. So something that uh, we talked about just briefly, but our Capital Advocacy Days so every week during the month of February, uh, we have a big push to really get folks from member programs to come to Jefferson City, participate in Capital Advocacy Days. Uh, and Jennifer, I was hoping you might talk a little bit about that and what folks can expect. Absolutely. Um, it's important to come to Jefferson City to uh, establish relationships with the staff as well as the legislators. Um, the staffers usually live around Jeff City, so not necessarily in the home district. And so it's a really important part of Capital Advocacy Days is that you're making those connections with the staff as well as the legislators. So our dates this year are February 5th, 12th. 20th and 26th, so it's on every Tuesday except the week of President's Day, it's on Wednesday that week. Um, we ask for Capital Advocacy Days um, during the month of February because appropriations, our budget process is in full swing that month. Programs always end up talking about the, the funding that is allowing them to provide their life-changing services, and we want programs meeting with their legislators earlier in session and not later. Mm -hmm. um, so February is a really important time time um, to be able to come. You schedule your own appointments, um, meet with me ahead of time. I give you packets with the NCA DSV stat sheet, encourage you to bring a brochure. We really want to co-brand with you to make sure that your legislators know the programs that are 
serving their districts and that MCA DSV is who is regularly representing you at the Capitol on a daily basis. Um, and so that's your opportunity to be able to pick a couple of our priority areas this year um, that most resonate for what you're seeing in your community. Um, there is no way you'll be able to talk about everything that we are tracking and reporting in our legislative update, but pick those one, two, maybe three things top um, that you are seeing that connect to our legislative priorities and to tell that story to your legislators so that they're hearing directly from their constituents or a program that is serving their district. Um, that's also an important part of those conversations. Um, a legislator who maybe is now serving in the Senate, who before was in the House, is unfamiliar with the additional programs that are now in this district. Um, or a member uh, agency last year met with a senator and he was unaware that although the shelter was located outside his district, they have court advocates who are regularly serving multiple counties in his district. So we really want them to understand what programs are providing services in their district, what are they seeing, and to make those connections. What are some quick tips that you would give for uh, folks at member programs who really want to participate? I think the, the first one is to be assured that when you go in to talk to a staffer or a legislator, you're the expert in the room. It can be intimidating the first time you go down um, to Jeff City to have meetings with legislators in the Capitol, but really they, they are going to benefit from the knowledge you walk in the room with. You know what's going on in your program, you know what the needs are uh, that are unmet, in your community, you know the stories of the survivors you work with every day, and that is information that they need and they want to hear from you. So even if it is a, a very brief meeting, it can have a big impact because you are the one that is coming from the home district with the information that legislator values and that the staffer values and that they need to do a better job. Be yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we talk to people on a regular basis about where we work, what we do. Um, I know that legislators can seem intimidating, but they are people. Um, and so you do know what your role is, what your services you're providing, and what your needs are. Um, so this is just sharing those stories in a different environment. And uh, every nonprofit has the legal right to educate their lawmakers. The only time something is quote unquote lobbying is when you say, legislator, I want you to vote no on Bill XYZ, or I want you to vote yes on Bill 9. That's lobbying. Your communications and your conversations about your program and the needs of your community, that's education. That's, that's time that you are afforded as a citizen, um, as a resident of the state of Missouri, that you get to have those conversations. And it's a real privilege that we get to do that. So sometimes people are concerned from their nonprofit that they aren't allowed to go have those kinds of meetings with legislators. And the reality is you are. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you brought that up because I think that can be a real concern for a lot of programs uh, from uh, their directors to their board of directors not really knowing exactly how to toe that line between education and lobbying, uh, what is allowed, what isn't allowed. And so I think really being clear about a lot of this work is education, uh, and that is your right to do as a program. Usually the one day or two or three or four days that you spend in these kinds of communications with lawmakers, they're going to be so far below the threshold. So the feds say that you as a nonprofit, your organization needs to spend no more than under just under 20% of your budget on nonpartisan legislative lobbying. And all of the coalition member programs are well under that threshold when we participate in Capital Ad Advocacy Days. And there is a misbelief that people think, oh, our grants say we can't lobby. That means you can't lobby on that grant time. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean your organization cannot lobby. And again, there's a difference between am I educating about our new program or am I lobbying? So you do want to be clear about if there's going to be a person who is going to be making those specific asks and lobbying, what are they billing their time? Or is that a board member who is coming to show even additional support and isn't um, billing a source? 
force for that time. They're doing it to show um, I care so much about this organization. I took a day off from work to be able to accompany staff to come here and tell you what our needs are. This is, this is often a time when those who have been fortunate to have been out of the situation that brought them face to face with your program, uh, those survivors who can come and comfortably tell their stories and they're in a place now in their lives where they can um, communicate and, and have the ability to safely tell their stories, that's often a very powerful uh, role that they can play in making a difference for so many others. Absolutely. And with all these communications, it's after somebody has been elected. Um, so this would be a very different conversation if we were talking about during campaigning, but this is somebody is an elected, part of their job being an elected legislator is to hear from their community. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's such a really good point, Jennifer, is that part of their job as lawmakers is to hear from constituents, to hear from the people back home in their district, and to really know and understand what issues are coming up there. Um, so outside of participating in Capital Advocacy Days, what are a few other ways that folks at member programs can get involved in public policy advocacy? Sure. My hope would be that Capital Advocacy Days is not the only time of year that programs are having contact with their with their legislators, but it is that reminder every year, especially when term limits with an election are, are taking effect. Um, but that this is the start of hopefully an ongoing relationship um, with those legislators would really encourage programs to invite legislators to tour their program when session is over. Maybe attend one of their events, maybe even ask them to speak <laughs> um, when the session is over. Um, so that there's ways when the General Assembly isn't meeting to also engage those legislators in ongoing communications. Um, also, social media has become a huge part of our grassroots advocacy. Um, it's really elevated um, our conversations because before maybe you met with someone and it was a private meeting and maybe not a lot of people knew about it, but now you share a photo, you talk about what you discussed. Now hundreds of people can be learning about that legislator's position on issues. Um, so it's become a really powerful tool um, to educate legislators about what we're working on. Um, the Mo Leg hashtag. Um, it's used in the Twitter world um, for lobbyists, government staff, legislators to be seen what are top policy issues um, of organizations, what are they working on. So when we share those posts or tweets, not only are we maybe connecting with that legislator if we've tagged them, but also people are following that and they're learning about what we're working on. So it's really been a game changer in terms of how many more people we can now engage in our public policy efforts. Well, and just to uh, the Mo Leg, it's hashtag <laughs> M O L E G for the Missouri Legislature. <laughs> so it it sounds pretty funny. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but it is it is where legislators and their staff members all go to every day, all throughout the day, to see what's what's going on, what's a priority, what are people talking about, what do I need to pay attention to. So programs that have been posting to um, using the MoLeg hashtag have really had an impact to especially like during budget process when the committee is meeting and talking about funding for sexual violence programs for programs to be able to post this these are the kinds of services that we are able to provide to rape victims and survivors in our community because of these dollars it's in real time it makes a real difference and it's it's just one of the many ways that social media has really elevated the conversation yeah, and I think that we have seen a lot of very direct examples of that just over the last couple of years when, as an organization, we have started increasing our presence on social media. And so seeing that we have been able to have a huge amount of reach that we never have before, both in terms of individuals working at our member programs, but the broader Missouri community, as well as having that really quick and direct uh, line of communication with staffers. And so knowing that people who are legislative staffers are constantly looking at Twitter and Facebook and seeing how many people are engaging there, that has real impact that we can see almost directly. And so I think that's a great way of talking about how 
social media has been a game changer. It's another tool in our advocacy toolbox that we can really start to use to our advantage. So to kind of wrap up our conversation uh, on, a, on a positive and uplifting note to keep people energized about our momentum, um, what are a couple examples of really successful public policy advocacy? The funding that we have. There was a time where there was no general revenue in Missouri's budget dedicated to domestic violence or sexual assault services. The line items and the increase of funding over time has been a direct result of agencies contacting their legislators talking about for us to be able to provide these services for the state to say it prioritizes services to victims of domestic and sexual violence means having some of its general revenue dedicated to it. So our funding is absolutely a great example of, of the, the strength of advocacy over the years. And there's some very tangible things that um, are addressed through, through legislation because of the advocacy community coming together and saying this is what we need to benefit survivors. There's no cost to get an order of protection. Um, sexual violence victims no longer have to pay for forensic evidence exams. Uh, school records of children are protected if they might disclose the address of uh, the other parent who is a victim of domestic violence from, from the estranged parent. There's, there's lots of arcane provisions and then the very overt ones like changing the law on rape so that every single felony offense has as an element of it and under Missouri laws of a lack of consent changing the nature of what is taught in schools about sexual assault, that there is information about what consent is, allowing for address confidentiality programs for victims of domestic violence, protecting information that would identify you in court records. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. It's not all uh, legislation about crime or about funding. It is about all of the many elements that we've identified through work with victims and survivors um, that identify ways in which they are still subject to harm and their well-being is compromised. So that's the voice of advocates who come into the system and say, you know what we need to change? We need to change this. And because Missouri is a very pragmatic state, we have a real opportunity aside from party affiliation to make changes because it really is a Missouri value that we don't want anyone who's hurt to be alone and not get help. There's lots of ways we go about it, but at its best in our state, that is our shared value in our culture. And we can build on that and we can expand that. The proof is what we've already accomplished and there's a lot more to do and there's also a need to make sure we don't lose ground. Mm -hmm. And that the rights that have already been respected continue to be respected and that no one's rights are uh, impinged upon by short-sighted legislation or public policy. And we have the ability to, to do that in Missouri, uh, not by alienating those who might not agree with us, but by continuing to advocate with them till we can find the common ground. And current House and Senate leadership have indicated that safer communities, safer neighborhoods is a top priority. So we need to connect our issues to how that will lead to a safer community and neighborhood. So we're at a really good place to be able to connect to those who are elected and their priorities with our issues. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and as you both are kind of sharing some of our successes, it made me think how important it is that we preserve the history of this work and share these stories with one another so that we can see those markers of social change and of successful advocacy uh, while also knowing that there's still more work to do and we still have more alliances to build to get there. And we can do it. Yeah. And we can do it. And we are. So with that, uh, we will have Capital Advocacy Days coming up in February. We will have legislative updates coming out at the end of every month through legislative session. Uh, and in between those times, always follow us on social media at MCADSV on both Facebook and Twitter for live updates. All right. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you.